So, hello, uh, my name is Richard Mott and I work at University College London and I'd like to thank Garant for the opportunity to talk today. So I want to talk about genotype encryption and explain why this is relevant to crop breeding. In particular, I want to address commercial crop breeders as well as those in the academic and public sectors to see if there is an appetite to use the methods that I'm going to, to describe to share genetic and phenotypic data. So, crop breeders face an important challenge in creating new varieties that are adapted to the changing climate. Sorry, Rogers, my okay. screen got out of sync. Um, this means that we need to first establish the agronomic value of every allele in our germplasm collections, and then design ways to combine the beneficial alleles to make improved varieties. And a barrier to this challenge is that some of the germplasm is proprietary for commercial or other reasons. However, grant funders want us to make data available and to follow the FAIR principles that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. We therefore need ways to combine phenotype and genotype data held in different databases so that we can discover the agronomic value of each allele, but without revealing individual genomes and phenotypes. And this is encapsulated in the slogan, uh, private genomes and public alleles or public SNPs. We have developed a computational method called HUGP to do this. The method is open source and was published in the journal Genetics in 2020. It uses random orthogonal transformations to encrypt genotypes and phenotypes, what are called the plain text, into a ciphertext in such a way that the ciphertext looks like random numbers, but it can still generate the correct quantitative genetics analysis. I'll describe the method in more detail later on, and it may be a test, but the first part of this talk is non-mathematical and presents the basic concepts. Importantly, HEGP provides a way for collaborators to first encrypt their own data and then share these ciphertexts so that what is some, sometimes called a federated genetic meta-analysis can be performed. In this diagram, I've represented an analysis of three studies. Each cube represents the data from a study and the process of encryption is shown as a rotation of the cube to generate a ciphertext. Genetic analysis of the plain texts, that is the unencrypted versions of each study, will yield the same answers as does the, a combined analysis of the ciphertexts. Here, genetic analysis includes performing genetic association using linear mixed models and estimating heritability, for example. But sharing data for genetic association analysis in this way means the power to detect associations is improved one could thereby discover associations of genetic variants that would be impossible to detect if each data set were analysed individually. The key reason is that combining studies increases the sample size and the power to detect genetic association at a locus depends on the sample size multiplied by the fraction of variants explained by variation at that locus. This in turn depends on the frequency of the allele and the underlying biological effect of the allele. In general, the closer the allele frequency is to a half, the greater the power. And while we can't change the biological effect of an allele, we can change its frequency by combining studies. So to do this, the collaborating parties, whether they are research institutes or commercial breeders, must first agree to share a common set of SNP sites to be genotyped or imputed and agree on which phenotypes are to be shared. They each encrypt their own genotypes and phenotypes for their proprietary germplasm using a key known only to themselves. And then they share that ciphertext with each other. We have shown in our genetics paper that you can still perform the same genome-wide association analyses using the shared and combined ciphertexts as you would with the raw plain text and get the same answers. It's important to emphasize that data collected on, on suboptimal germplasm, perhaps produced as a byproduct of development of successful varieties, 
is just as important for genetic mapping as are, are these elite varieties. Recall, we want allele frequencies to be close to a half if possible. And in fact, a mapping population entirely consisting of germplasm that was fixed for certain beneficial alleles could not determine that it had any beneficial effect. The results of the federated analysis will be common knowledge among participants and published so that the wider community benefits from, from these results. And importantly, the results, particularly the estimates of allelic effects on agronomic traits, could be applied back to perform genetic genomic prediction on private individual genome data held by each study participant, so that it will be possible to design efficient crossing, crossing schemes to combine beneficial alleles, and where necessary, to negotiate the sharing of germplasm between parties. This is just a brief overview of the strategy. I hope that a sufficient number of groups and companies would be interested in forming a consortium to test this idea. My group has been awarded a grant by the BBSRC to develop this methodology into a practical scheme. And if you are interested in participating, please get in contact with me. So, um, I'll stop at this stage to see if there's any questions on the, the general principles before I go on to the, um, the mathematics underlying the method. Um, are there any questions? Uh, doesn't look like at the moment, I should know. So. Okay, I'll um, crack on them. So I'm now going to describe the ideas and mathematics behind HEGP in a little more detail. Um, and it's very helpful to think of genotypes and phenotypes geometrically. Suppose we have a study involving a thousand individuals, that is, you know, varieties of wheat, for example, and they've all been genotyped at a large number of SNPs. Well, we can think of each SNP site as a point in a thousand dimensional space whose coordinates are the genotypes represented as their genotype dosages. That is, each SNP is a vector, 1000 genotype dosages corresponding to the different individuals. Similarly, the phenotype is represented as a vector of a thousand numbers in the same space. Now, when we calculate the genetic association between a phenotype and the genotype, in essence, we are working out the angle between the phenotype vector and the genotype vector in this space. We don't care about the length of the vectors, just the angle between them. So we can think of the vectors on the, as being on the surface of a hypersphere. In the diagram, I've shown this just in two dimensions for clarity, but you should imagine this is a you know, 1000 dimensional space and this is a 999 dimensional hypersphere sitting inside that space which of course is a very simple thing to do. So in this diagram I've shown this um, in just two dimensions and the angle theta one between SNP one and the phenotype y is smaller than the angle theta two between SNP two and, and y. So that means that SNP one is more strongly associated with y. And the p-value of the strength of association can be calculated just from the, these angles. It should be geometrically clear that if one rotates the coordinate system, the angles between the genotype and phenotype vectors are unaffected. This means that we can choose any coordinate system and get the same GWAS results. So the idea behind HEGP is to choose a random coordinate system by rotating using a randomly chosen orthogonal matrix, such that each genotype vector transforms into a set of random numbers. On the left, I've shown a typical plain text matrix of genotype dosages, in which each row is one individual and each column vector is a SNP. The shades of gray indicate the genotype dosages, which in this example take just the numbers zero, one, and two corresponding to the number of reference alleles. I've also represented the phenotype vector by a column of gray shades. Rotating the plaintext genotype matrix by a random orthogonal matrix results in cipher, a ciphertext matrix on the right, in which all the entries now look like they are random numbers sampled from a normal distribution. Each entry is now a random linear combination of the original genotypes. The phenotype vector gets transformed in the same way. 
What's so special about orthogonal transformations? Well, as we saw geometrically, they don't change angles between vectors. Mathematically, we calculate the transformation by multiplying the plain text by an orthogonal matrix P representing the random orthogonal transformation. Orthogonal matrices have the magical property that when you multiply them by their transpose, they give the identity matrix. In other words, their inverse is, the, is their transpose. In this diagram, sorry, this means that when we fit a linear mixed model to the data in order to perform a GWAS, the effects of the rotation cancel out and we get the same result as a GWAS on the plain text data. The linear mixed model is, is the workhorse for quantitative genetic analysis, but it's worth mentioning that, there are, that related methods such as ridge regression and lasso are also unaffected by orthogonal rotations, and so it can be accommodated within the HGGP framework. Here are some real results for RAP, a RAP data set. I've compared the p-values of genetic association compare, uh, obtained on the plain text with those from the ciphertext and represented them in a standard way as negative log 10 p-values. You can see that the results are essentially identical except for negligible differences caused by rounding errors. Similarly, the estimated heritability of the trait is almost the same. So in summary, as I said earlier, the purpose of this talk is to gauge how much interest there is, would be in sharing genetic and phenotypic data between commercial and academic stakeholders. Remember that data from failed varieties is as important as from good ones for the purpose of genetic association. Well, if there is any interest, what kind of infrastructure is needed? Please send your thoughts to me, Richard Mott at UCL. Finally, I'd like to Thank, I'd like to uh, thank my co-authors and funders, as well as uh, UK Plant Sciences Presents for the opportunity to speak today. And with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thanks very much, Richard. That was that was uh, quicker than expected there. So thank you very much, though, for for that. Very interesting stuff and a, a kind of a, an introduction. And hopefully it will uh, um, stimulate people to ask some, some mm -hmm. questions about this. So as I said, if anyone wants to um, put a virtual hand up to ask a question or, or write a question in the Q&A, then please do. Um, you might have taken people by surprise by, by finishing right so, so rapidly, I think. But so let me ask a, a kind of general question as well about um, to, mm -hmm. if you can provide a, an example where you've used this method within uh, for crop improvement. Can you, can you give a, an example of that? No, we haven't used it yet um, okay. because all our collaborations are with um, people who don't mind showing their, their data as plain text. Um, so I'm particularly trying to get in contact with commercial breeders who I imagine, maybe I'm mistaken, you know, must have a large amount of germplasm, which you know, it, 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 it doesn't represent material that is suitable for uh, commercial release, but you know, contains alleles of interest. And by combining that in that information with other people's studies you know we have we have the opportunity to discover things that we can't find within our own data sets alone that so the, the only well the reason for giving this talk is to see whether there's any interest in mm -hmm. you know from 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 the commercial side in in uh, uh sharing data data in in, in this way well, I think, but, you know, obviously in human genetics, which is partly the space I work in, that there's been a lot of thought given to um, genetic privacy, but it seems to me that the same principles will apply to crop breeding as well. Mm -hmm. Can you give an idea about the, the amount of data that you, the number of data sets that you prefer to work with or you could work with or, you know, ideally? So... Compared to human studies, um, I think most, certainly studies involving crops are very small. Um, I've, I've successfully run the, the, the methodology on sets of size 10,000 individuals and many, many thousands of SNPs. Mm -hmm. So there's an R package 
called HEGP that you can download from GitHub, which has a, a, a working but you know, basic version of, of this. Um, and you can certainly encrypt 10, say 10,000 individuals in say, you know, a couple of hours probably depending on the speed of your processor. You do need a fair amount of RAM, but not, not nothing sort of exceptional. Okay. So, and once you've done the transformation, the calculating genetic association is essentially the same as, as with unencrypted data. So that doesn't take any longer. So, you know, there's a small computational overhead in encrypting the data. Uh, but other than that, it's the same, it's the same um, procedure. Okay. So we have a question um, from uh, well, anonymous attendee. So um, they ask, can HAGP, HEGP, uh, can it be applied for perennial crop breeding? For example, oil palm? I don't see why I'm not. not. I, I assume by that you're interested in, in observations on the same plant over many years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. That might be. So you might be interested then in having like a random effect for each plant, possibly. Um, yeah, if anyone, if the person who asked that wants to put a, a virtual hand up and, and um, say a bit more then please please so do. i think i uh, i'd have to go into details but i think in principle well you could certainly anything that you can represent say within henderson's mixed model framework will fit within the hgp framework i've checked that mm -hmm. um uh i think it seems to me that the the issue here is that you have additional um random effects uh and i I would need to double check the particular model, but I think I think they can be accommodated. Okay, so another question here. So how would you handle, this is also from anonymous attendee, how would you handle different sources of phenotype data for variations in phenotyping methods or platforms? So you would need to include um, what are called covariates, okay? And they can be done in, uh, handled in exactly the same way as phenotypes. So, so for example, Supposing you're measuring yield, <clears throat> um, you know, so different different studies have been measuring yield on different, say, varieties of wheat. Um, you can imagine these have been done in different years. Some of them will have different fertilizer treatments. You know, some of them will be in parts of the country which had higher rainfall, and so forth. Um, so, so you would need to agree upfront which which of these additional pieces of information should be shared. Okay. And they, so they would be, co excuse me, covariates. Um, and they would be included in a model just as you would with any other, um, you know, li 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 linear mix model. Okay. And I think, we, so we have another question in the Q and A, which is along the similar lines about um, changes in, in environmental conditions. We have a, we have a question in the um, uh, in the chat from Gregor. He says, "Nice method." Um, so the challenge is that when an entity shares data in encrypted form, uh, they would still be enabling competitors by sharing. So the real question, I think, is how the results of the analysis are used downstream, and how does that involve shared IP? Well, it's an interesting question. So if if you um, discover something using encrypted data from somebody else to what extent does ip reach back to to the original um uh, well yeah the, the participants um i did actually talk to a um a lawyer at ucl about this question um and it, 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 it seems there isn't any any legal basis for for reach back, but I'm no I'm no lawyer. Yep. Um, I think it, it I think this is one of the things where you know you have to form a consortium and you have to have an agreement as to what the um, 
you know, if, if, if a benefit arises, how, how that uh, benefit is, 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 is passed back. I mean, you, you could have a situation where two commercial breeders each have germplasm, which has um, a beneficial genotype fixed, but in opposite phases. So each study indiv individually could not detect that that allele was beneficial, but the combined study could. So then they could each, they'd each realize that that allele is important. So they could include, you know, they could breed that allele into um, the varieties that are actually going to release. So, so they, they, you know, in an ideal world, they would, they would both benefit from, from that. But, you know, they might take the view that this is, a, you know, this is a zero sum benefit. And so uh, we aren't going to do it. But, you know, I think, well, we all know we are facing unprecedented challenges um, and we really need to pull, pull our data. Absolutely. So uh, Andrea put her hand up and as you can see, she popped up on the screen. So Andrea, you are able to, to talk now and can be heard. So would you like to ask a question? If you unmute, unmute yourself. Sorry, that was an accidental raised hand. Ah, <laughs> okay. Okay, that's fine. Right. Um, so we have a question from Ian McKay. Um, so I guess, and, and he's kind of putting this out to the uh, the breeders present. I'm not sure there are many plant breeders here, or if, but anyone wants to answer on, on their behalf, um, or maybe you can give a perspective from um, from from your in, your um, discussions, uh, Richard. So Ian asks, is mm -hmm. there is there scope to collaborate in producing a shared training population for um, proprietal genomic selection? Have you discussed okay. Have you discussed that with anyone? No, I haven't. I'm, uh, this, this, I should. I have not discussed this method with a plant breeder yet. I mean, a commercial plant breeder, which is why I'm having this, presenting this thing now. Um, it, I, I think Ian raises an important point, which is that it, it is better to kind of go in and design a collaboration from the ground up, <clears throat> where you know you're going to agree to measure the same sorts of things and collect the same sorts of covariates than to retrospectively combine data. You, you know, you can do that, but you, you, know, you end up having to kind of not normalize the hell out of your, your data to, to remove all possible um, confound, confounding factors. Um, so yes, I, I, well, at least I assume that's what Ian is getting at, that you need, you need to have preparatory discussions. Okay, so we have another question. So again, another anonymous question. So if the SNP set is different uh, between different mm -hmm. data sets, do you have to work with overlapping SNPs only? And if not, does it improve power to add data sets where the SNP of interest is fixed for one allele? Uh, you would need, well, <clears throat> answering the first part of that question, yes, you need to have a common set of SNPs. You can impute to a common set. So I don't think that is a huge problem it's you know it's a solvable computational thing mm -hmm. um can you repeat the second question yeah, so um oh well i guess it's it says if not if you don't need a overlapping set of snips but you said you do so it says if not does does it improve power to add data sets where the snip of interest is fixed for one allele i guess you answered that uh i think I think you're imagining a situation, say, where you have, um, supposing a SNP is at 50% allele frequency in one study and it's totally fixed in another study. If you combine the data, are you any better off? Um, that's an interesting edge case. In fact, I was just working out the, the effect on power when you do that. And it turns out, I think, power is unchanged. <clears throat> so that's like the worst case you can do is have a, a perfectly balanced study and then you add garbage to it and the effect is neutral, okay? But I think for any other situation, you actually do improve power. Okay, so a question from CJ uh, Yang. Uh, thanks for a nice talk, CJ. Does the, does the encryption strength correlate with sample size, uh, number of individuals and SNPs? Yes, I think the larger the sample size, the 
stronger the encryption. For example, if you had a single individual, you, <clears throat> you couldn't encrypt them using this scheme. Mm -hmm. okay. Makes sense. 